While the story of the mass internment of Japanese Americans in California, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington has been well documented over the years, very little is known about the Hawaii internees, and even less is known about the confinement sites located in Hawaii. In 1885, larger numbers of Japanese began to immigrate to Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations. They came in search of a better life. By 1920, Japanese immigrants and their children made up 40% of Hawaii's population. For many of the Issei or first generation, the dream of a better life was coming true. but there were dark clouds gathering over the islands. The Nationality Acts of 1790 and 1870 restricted Japanese immigrants from naturalization. In 1922, the Supreme Court case Ozawa versus the U.S. denied the Issei U.S. citizenship. The ruling stated that Japanese immigrants were ineligible for citizenship because they were not of the Caucasian race. The Issei would continue to be classified as aliens and then as alien enemies during World War II. The sugar planters were really in control of the economy and polity of Hawaii. The military was a different entity and they were competitors. Um, they were competitors over land and competing interests. But their interests, their competing interests came together in the strikes that Japanese Americans engaged in. One in terms of security, the other in terms of labor. The military examined the Japanese menace in Hawaii, and they concluded that they couldn't identify those who would be, quote, loyal to the U.S. or disloyal to the U.S. So they quickly then, in the Summerall Report, moved to identifying leaders of the community rather than those who would be disloyal. And it targeted them for detention in the event of war. George Patton, who was stationed in Hawaii during the 1930s, also devised a similar plan. This uh, plan eventually got scuttled, but it morphed into uh, what is called the ABC list. It contained an extremely detailed plan of arrest and detention of different categories of Japanese Issei. At the same time, the FBI was also gathering intelligence on the Japanese in the islands. The FBI created the Custodial Detention List. It became the initial list used to arrest the Japanese in Hawaii for internment. Tensions rose between the U.S. and Japan, and the possibility of war loomed. But in Hawaii, the Japanese immigrant Issei and their children, the Nisei, went about their daily lives. I come from a family of nine, including my grandpa, who we called Ji-sang, and six of us children. Life was quite peaceful and very quiet because this was in Haleiwa. My dad became a tailor. Although he had gone to McKinley High School and he was a high school grad, he ended up becoming a tailor to help my grandfather. We were not rich, but we were not poor. You know, we had a good life. My mother's father, my maternal grandfather, um, was Tamosaku Watanabe. He was appointed uh, a counselor agent by the Japanese consulate partly because he lived in Ola'a and he was a minister. The people who lived in the area needed help with various literacy issues. Consular agents were not paid by the Japanese government. It was primarily to help Japanese citizens and dual citizens in Hawaii process records of birth, death, marriage, divorce with the Japanese government. Because of this affiliation with the Japanese government, they were targeted for internment. 
Another group that was looked at suspiciously for being pro-Japanese were the Japanese language school teachers, like Otokichi Ozaki. Otokichi Ozaki came to Hilo in 1917 at the age of 12, and then in 1924, I believe, he uh, was asked to teach at a Japanese language school, which he did, and uh, he did that and was um, very well liked by his students. When he and his family moved to Amaulu Plantation, which is a sugar plantation, he took on the task of tutoring the plantation kids in both their Japanese and English studies. Well, my husband's name was Kuniyaki Nishioka. And then for the convenience of living in America, he was nicknamed Bob. He was born July 1, 1916 in Honolulu. And when he was 12 years old, his father decided to pull up stakes and return back to Japan. And when he came back to Hawaii, it was 1939. He got a job at the Nishihonganji High School, teaching Japanese language. And he had just gotten into UH. Then the war broke out. I mean, that was the most traumatic event in my life. I still remember that morning, 7.50. I was at dormitory, mid-pack. All of a sudden, music stopped, Hawaiian music. Announcer came out again. This is a war, entire Hawaiian island under enemy attack. Then we noticed that there were soldiers next to our house where the bridge was, and they started shooting their rifles at the planes. I remember seeing the newspaper which said war. I said W-A-R, it was in huge letters. I mean, I didn't know what that word was. Martial law was soon declared. Martial law means military control of a particular territory within the U.S., and that civil liberties or the Constitution is suspended. On December 7, 1941, arrest squads were mobilized. The War Department ordered the arrest of all names on the FBI custodial detention list. So as the smoke still rose from Pearl Harbor, these squads went to various districts in Hawaii, not only on Oahu, but all the other islands, locating those people to arrest them. From my research, there were 391 individuals who were arrested in Hawaii between those two days. And most of the Kocho Sensei, the principals of Japanese schools, and senior teachers were rounded up. Men who had status, business leaders or physicians, Buddhist and Shinto priests were another large group arrested on December 7th and 8th. Over half the names on the custodial detention list were volunteer consular agents like the Reverend Tamasaku Watanabe, or those performing consular duties like the Reverend Paul Osumi of Kauai. I never asked my parents their thoughts and feelings of that day, but I'm pretty sure my father was quite surprised that he was just arrested, and he was taken to the Wailua County Jail in Wailua. The primary traits were leadership in the Japanese communities. The most marvelous kind of account of that was this publisher, Soga Yasutaro, and he describes how hearing the news of Pearl Harbor, it filled him with dread. Towards the evening, he got ready he said he expected something to happen. He had his shoes on and everything when three agents knocked at his door and they just said, come with us. And he said, where am I going? And they're not gonna tell him. They weren't gonna tell him. And his wife, he says, as she went out the gate, whispered in his ear, don't catch a cold. And Soga then was put into this car, and there were other people, and it's, they stopped along the way to pick up others. 
And he said the streets were all dark and deserted and there were sentries posted at various places and taken to the immigration station, relieved of all of his personal belongings, and then shoved upstairs into this room, which is dark, and he couldn't see anything. Soga fumbled around in the darkness and eventually found a place to sleep. He realized there were a large number of men locked in the room with him. On the Big Island, Otokichi Ozaki experienced a similar fate. So he was picked up. Uh, the FBI agent said, you might want to bring some clothes with you because you may be gone for three or four days. So he was put into a paddy wagon, and uh, one by one, other men would join him in the paddy wagon, and then they took them to Kilauea military camp. He said the only thing that he was allowed to bring to the camp was his keys, his wallet, a handkerchief, and a sweater. Across the territory of Hawaii, on the islands of Kauai, Maui, Oahu, and the Big Island, similar arrests were taking place. Back at Kilauea military camp, Ozaki composes a tanka poem. And then the very next day, they were lined up, and he didn't know what was going to happen to them. He saw the guards with their guns, and he thought they might be shot. But it turns out that they were going to be um, led into the cafeteria to be uh, fed. This time was very bewildering. They really did not know what was going to happen to them. Uh, they didn't know if they were going to be alive the next day. There were about 112 and uh, they stayed there for about 72 days before being shipped off to Honolulu. In the morning, he recognized people as the leaders of the community, his friends. Move! Move! Go! He said these soldiers were young kids, you know, and a lot of them were quite nervous, actually. But they ordered them around with those bayonets pointing at them, and he said, we would have died a dog's death, a dog's death, had we sort of answered back. All Oahu internees were first processed through the U.S. immigration station. Both Soga and Ozaki wrote about the poor living conditions during the early days of the war. At dinner time, they were served these oval, like, army tins that food was just slopped into. He also said that they had to eat after the German and Italian detainees who ate first and then dumped their mess kits in these buckets of water. So by the time the Japanese ate, they had to grab those from that. It's like a slop can. So he felt kind of sickened by the uh, greasy utensils that he had to use. They had to share coffee cups. You know, it's demeaning of their uh, dignity. These were the leaders of the community, you see. And that's the kind of treatment given to the leaders, which was then a lesson to the rest of the population, you see. <laughs> While at the immigration station, Ozaki finds strength in a bean plant he sees growing outside the fence. There are 13 known sites used for the internment of the Japanese in Hawaii during World War II. Some of them housed only one or two internees. Others held up to several hundred. The Sand Island Detention Facility was quickly opened on December 9, 1941. Internees lived in tents for six months until barracks were built. The camp would also flood during heavy rains. And they would bring over the ones who were held on the neighbor islands to the main facility at Sand Island. Between 1941 and 1943, almost all of the Hawaii internees were processed through Sand Island at some point. 
Mr. Ozaki was in a total of about eight different camps throughout Hawaii and the mainland, and he said that by far Sand Island was where he received the worst treatment. In one of the best accounts, a written account by the journalist Yasutaro Soga, you really see, especially at Sand Island in the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, the tensions were very high, conditions were very harsh. Internees at Sand Island were made to do manual labor. Many of the older Issei, who were leaders, priests, and teachers, were not used to these harsh conditions. He recounts episodes where there was a clear intent to kind of emasculate and even embarrass the men. A spoon is missing from the mess hall! You all know the rules of this camp! You are to have no metal objects on your person! The person who has the spoon, step forward now! If no one will step forward, you will all be searched. Sergeant! Sir! Strip search the prisoners. Yes, sir! You are the captain! All clothes come off right now! Move it! Right now! Move it! Take your clothes off! Drop it right at your feet! Let's go! Move it! Move it! The misplaced spoon was later found in the mess hall. The internees were subjected to many strip searches. What is this, Okaro? There was an incident, for example, where a gentleman had a knife-like object made from a belt buckle. And because of that, he had to be strip searched and he was standing stark naked while the guards went through his belongings and his clothing and everything else. And they made all the other internees stand there naked as Mr. Ozaki pointed out, with the rains coming in from Nuwanu, very cold time. Hearings were held for the internees. They were pressed with questions of loyalty. Did you buy Japanese government bonds? No. Did you buy American bonds? No. Why didn't you buy them? I intended to buy them, but had no money at the time. You could have bought them if you wanted to. Are you pro-Japan? No. Are you pro-Japan? No. Who do you want to win the war? Japan or America? I do not like war. What do you think of the greater East Asia coal prosperity sphere? I think Japan has a right to stand on her own two feet. Do you want Japan to win the war? It is not a simple question. Then you're against America. The board at Ozaki's hearing finds Ozaki is a subject of Japan. Ozaki is loyal to Japan and that his activities have been pro-Japanese. The FBI had interviewed people on the plantation prior to his arrest. One mechanic said that Ozaki had the shortwave radio and was probably using it for dangerous activities. In reality, Ozaki had other uses for his radio. He was downloading the information from the Domain News Agency, which is like an Associated Press in Japan at the time, and he would use that information to broadcast news uh, on Japanese radio in the Hilo area and also uh, for the newspaper that he worked for. General statements of suspicion applied to broad categories of people on the detention list, as in the case of Tamasaku Watanabe. These men are chosen from the leading alien Japanese in the communities and are believed to act as espionage agents or observers. Clearly, the people who were on this list uh, had, had not done anything wrong. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942. The order led to the mass removal and incarceration of 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry on the U.S. West Coast. Historians have been looking for, like, why Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. There are various theories. Franklin Roosevelt, in 1936, writes this memorandum inquiring of military intelligence what plans did they have 
to control the Japanese in Hawaii. And he used the words, it occurs to me that we can put U.S. citizens and Japanese citizens alike into concentration camps. Those were his words. This was written on August 10th, 1936. So that's five years before Pearl Harbor was attacked. Unlike the U.S. mainland, Hawaii avoided a mass internment of the Japanese population. The martial law governor of Hawaii, General Delos Emmons, made this decision despite pressure from Washington calling for a mass internment. He was influenced in part by intelligence officers and members of the Council for Interracial Unity, which included YMCA executives Hung Wai Ching, Charles Loomis, and a Japanese-American Nisei, Shigeo Yoshida. Emmons also stated that a mass internment would cause logistical problems and labor shortages in Hawaii. They also comprised the majority of the laborers on the sugar plantations of the island, and the sugar plantations were the mainstay of the island's economy. So without their labor, the island's uh, economy would have collapsed. While removing the leaders of the community, uh, nearly 2,000 of them, and having the controls of martial law, the military ingeniously, I think, was able to then control the situation and enable the productive labor of Japanese Americans. Robert Shivers, the head of the Hawaii FBI office, also did not believe in a mass internment of the Japanese. Arrests and selective internment continued on into 1942. Harry Urata was a Nisei language school teacher. First part, when I came back from Japan, I was teaching Japanese school. At the time, lots of Nisei were teaching Japanese school. My friend, they, they got arrested. And so I thought, oh, maybe tomorrow, maybe I gotta go. One day, Urata was called out of democracy class at Mid-Pacific Institute. Are you Urata? Harry Urata? Yes. He was arrested on the spot. Kuniaki Bob Nishioka was also a Japanese language school teacher. Then after the war started, everything was shut down, no more Japanese school. So then he just had to look for whatever job that would give him income. And he was working at the supermarket when he was picked up by the FBI. Sam Nishimura, the tailor from Haleiwa, was also visited by the FBI. But I remember one day, I guess it did happen in April, that there were some men who came to question him. They went into my room and um, opened all the drawers. And I said, what are you looking for? They didn't answer. They just searched all over the house. And then they took my dad away. That's what I remember about that day. Nishimura's wife was left to care for six children. Nishimura was arrested because prior to World War II, he co-signed a banknote for a truck, which was sent to the Japan Red Cross. About 800, maybe a little more, were sent to internment camps in the continental United States. And these were almost entirely Issei. And over the course of the spring and summer of 42, 10 shiploads of Issei took these men uh, from Sand Island to these uh, various internment centers in the continental U.S. I would say that most of the Issei from Hawaii ended up in Santa Fe, probably over 600. Soga, Ozaki, and Watanabe would all eventually end up in the Santa Fe internment camp. Prior to that, the journey from Hawaii took them to other internment camps in places such as Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Livingston, Louisiana, and Lordsburg, New Mexico. On some transport ships headed to the mainland, there were two types of Japanese passengers. The 
but also the soldiers were prisoners because they had no choice. They had to prove their loyalty to the U.S. Nisei soldiers comprised the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In 1943, President Roosevelt approved the creation of a segregated Japanese-American Army unit. When the call for volunteers went out, 10,000 men from Hawaii volunteered. The 100th Infantry Battalion, made up of Japanese-American soldiers from Hawaii, who were already in the Army prior to the war, eventually became a part of the 442nd. They had to demonstrate in blood, shed on the battlefield, that they were real Americans. They are still the highest decorated military unit for its size and length of service in the history of the U.S. military. There was a list of Japanese civilian internees from Hawaii who had sons in the military. And there were 161 names of Issei and over 200 sons in the military. So there were some who had one, a number who had two, a few who had three and four. Back in Hawaii, a different group of Nisei were moving to a new internment camp. When Sand Island closed in March of 1943, uh, those who were left, which were almost entirely Nisei, were transferred to the Honolululi camp. Most of them, at least initially, were Kibe, that is Nisei who were born in Hawaii and thus U.S. citizens, but who had been educated in part in Japan. And for various reasons, that group was deemed the most suspect by U.S. authorities. Honoulu'uli was the largest internment camp in Hawaii. It encompassed about 160 acres, and it was built originally to hold 3,000. Honoulu'uli also held a number of local Germans and female internees. And the largest group at Honoulu'uli actually were POWs. Doris Berg Nye was 11 years old when the FBI came to arrest her mother. So then this dark car comes in, and uh, these two men dressed up like Elliot Ness with their hats on, and I thought, relatives. So they said, where's your mom? We'd like to speak to your mom. And I said, well, just a minute, please. And mom was just coming from the other house, side of the house. So I guess I was yelling to her. And she looked at me, and she says, Doris, these guys want to have, they want to talk to me. I'll be right back. So then they left. And I was worried. I was worried sick. What had happened? What's the matter? How come they have, what, how come dad hasn't come home from work yet? Her father, Frederick Berg, was also arrested. Doris did not know what happened to her parents for several months. She thought they both died. I was screaming and screaming and screaming because my whole world had fallen apart. She learned they were interned and remembers visiting them at Honoulu'uli. Honouli Uli was totally barren then. It was huge. And then there were some tents, and that's where my parents were, in tents. Two of the most interesting cases uh, at Honouli Uli involved members of the legislature. In 1940, uh, Sanji Abe had been elected to the Territorial Senate, the first Japanese-American Republican. He was a Nisei. And Thomas T. Sakakihara, was elected to the territorial house. It was a big deal for the community in 1940 because there were still relatively few Japanese Americans who held political office at that time. And then two years later, 1942, they were arrested and thrown into an internment camp, both of them at Honoulu'uli. Before becoming a senator, Sanji Abe was a former policeman, served the US Army in World War I, and was a respected leader in Hilo. He co-owned a Japanese movie theater. The name of the uh, theater is Yamatoza. After the war started, Abe gave instructions to his employees to remove anything Japanese from the theater. That was to protect themselves and also to show uh, his loyalty. On August 2nd, 1942, the FBI searched his theater and found a Japanese flag. Abe claimed it was planted. Then uh, he was arrested, Abe Sanjisa. Mm. Abe was released and then arrested again a month later. He was sent to Sand Island and then Honoulu'uli. 
Abe was forced to resign his Senate seat. The Honolulu site, it was developed by the military with no basis of constitutional law, and it was completely classified so that it was not known to the public. A lot of people knew that something was happening out ever side, but uh, we had no idea where and how it was done. Eight people in one wow. shack. I see. Eight people. Uh -huh. I don't think I uh, had a hot shower, you know, when I really, no. That time is hot. No oh. short pants. Cut your short pants up to here. Internees called the area Jigoku Dani, which means Hell Valley. How come I'm not staying inside here? Although I'm an American citizen, we are there under suspicion. You know, they just suspect us. Then they have a dining room, everybody get together, wife and children. The internees get talk to you. Don't forget, study hard for school, because school is important, yeah? But don't forget, take care of your brothers and sisters, yeah? And I remember somebody explaining that he is not a prisoner, he is an intern. And I thought, well, what is the difference? Because, you know, the Pop isn't at home. I just wanted to see him. When are you coming back? back as soon as I can, all right? I recall where my dad would give my mom gifts, like turtles that he had fashioned from cowrie shell. So I still remember getting those uh, rings made out of toothbrush <laughs> handles. I used to marvel at how, how did they do that? I made this for you. Keep it with you, and I'll be And in fact, he used to say that that was a good way to keep yourself occupied because some of them were going stir crazy, just sitting and doing nothing. First, I studied English. Then uh, I play mahjong, play card. And then I go farm, brand deer, farmer's brand deer. You have to do something, otherwise the time no fly. Nishimura's wife asked to move into a mainland internment camp so the family could be together. My mother decided that we have to be away from dad so long, it's not good, so we should go to the mainland and be all together. So we got ready to go and my mother bought a lot of stuff for us for the Koko country. And all of a sudden in January, everything stopped. And then he was released on January 19th. So he came back. Sam Nishimura was released after nearly two years of internment. In 1943, the Reverend Paul Osumi was now incarcerated at the euphemistically named Kila River Relocation Center. My father came down with what is called valley fever, and he got really sick. Never mentioned his illness to my mother when he was in the barrack hospital. He didn't want to concern my mother with his ailment. A family friend wrote to Osumi's wife in Hawaii about Paul's condition. They were worried he might pass away. Osumi's wife and children voluntarily entered Gila River. As soon as my mother and my brother and I landed up in Gila, he started to get better. I guess it gave him a lot more encouragement with uh, the family there with him. Osumi's family remained there until the end of the war. Otokichi Ozaki's wife and children also entered into a mainland internment camp so that the family could be together. And then in 1943, in January, his family tried to join him and they were sent to Jerome, Arkansas. However, Otokichi had to remain in the Santa Fe internment camp. Let's 
カップの日への手にしみるかな They tried to get together many, many times, but it wasn't until、uh, May of 1944 that, that he was able to join them in Jerome. After a year of living in separate internment camps, the Ozaki family was finally reunited at Jerome, Arkansas, and then the Tule Lake Incarceration Center in California. Also headed to Tule Lake were a group of 67 internees from Hono Uli Uli. Which included Harry Urata and Bob Nishioka. That was the place where all the so called no no boys and those who had、uh, expressed a desire to go back to Japan after the war were segregated. They were brought to Tule Lake and they were in an area called、uh, the、uh, Block 99. And、uh, they were not allowed to enter the main part of the camp where we were, they were fenced off on the other side. They put us in a stockade. They watch how we, we want to do, you know, react. But nothing happened. But he told me that they could see through the fence because it was one of those link fences, iron fences, and they were ha- so happy to see women and children. Bob first met Shizuye at Tule Lake. Three months later, They were married. But then, of course, you know, we were married in camp, and then、um, we had no idea when the war would be ending. In December of 1944, the government rescinds the exclusion order after the Supreme Court decision ex parte endo. The decision stated that loyal citizens could not be lawfully detained. Internees were allowed to return to the West Coast in January of 1945. Tule Lake remains open until 1946. Bob Nishioka never returned to live in Hawaii. He and Shizuye settled in California after being released. On Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for Japan. With the Ozakis, they debated for a long time with their family back in Hawaii about、uh, whether or not they should repatriate to Japan or go back to Hawaii. And in the end,、um, Mr. Ozaki's parents won out and they said,、oh, Of course, Hawaii is so much better, please come back here. When w- war ended, then I made my mind, I gotta do something for America. Urata then taught Japanese to the military intelligence service. He returned to Hawaii and became a successful music teacher for 53 years. The Nisei veterans of the 100th, 442nd, and MIS returned and helped to reshape the future of Hawaii. However, for the Hawaii internees, their return was not as celebrated. You know, if you were one of these thousand or so who were thrown in camp, you must have been guilty of something. So, I think there was the stigma that a lot of these families carried around that they didn't want to talk about. But I think precisely because there were so few, the, those of us growing up after the war、um, assumed that something must have been wrong with them. I, I knew that when his friends came, you know, they never came during the day, they just came during the night to see him. And we don't blame them to.、Uh, For feeling like that, I guess they don't want to be associated with an intern, intern person. We stopped talking because if I started to talk to my dad about it, he would get so angry. And my mom would, don't, don't talk about it, don't talk about it, don't, I, I don't want to hear about it, don't talk about it. And she'd get very upset. None of those who were interned have ever been charged with a crime. Sabotage or assault or what have you, none of them. I think, you know, my grandfather,、um, when I asked him why, why he didn't talk about it and why his kids didn't know about it, he said that for the longest time he was really angry. He was angry at the government for taking him. And then when he came back, he was angry at people who came to see him because they had to sneak and see him. And I think that made it really hard for him to talk about. But it's amazing how he could go on with his life in a real positive way. 
After his release, Sanji Abe, the first territorial senator of Japanese ancestry, never returned to politics. He told uh, his kids, you have to expect uh, anything during the war time. Time will change everything. In 1966, Abe was awarded the Ranju Hosho Imperial Decoration by the Japanese government for his service to the Hawaii Japanese community. Watanabe resumed his ministry, this time on Maui. Soga returned to Hawaii in 1945 and resumed his work at the Nippu Jiji newspaper, now called the Hawaii Times. Ozaki returned to Hawaii and also worked at the Hawaii Times. In later years, he became the general manager. He just jumped right back in, as I believe a lot of Issei did. He was, as I mentioned, a Renaissance man, and he developed something called the Ozaki Red, which is still very much in profusion today. It's known for its hardiness and its beauty and its red color and its size. Osumi and his family moved to Oahu he became well known for his newspaper column. He wrote a column for the Honolulu Advertiser, which was called Today's Thought. Although he was a Christian Protestant minister, um, he was not really quoting the Bible or anything. He was just giving people simple daily thoughts of how to live a happy life. In 1952, the Issei were allowed to obtain U.S. citizenship. Many of them finally became naturalized citizens. They wanted to just kind of blend in and be part of this, this change that was going on in Hawaii. So I think there was this real incentive to just kind of bury this part of the story. After the war, Honolulu in particular, but the, the whole internment story was largely forgotten. And along with that, the story of what happens to these sites. In the 1970s, Japanese Americans began a movement to seek redress from the federal government. Groups of uh, Japanese Americans throughout the West Coast primarily sought to question the, the legality of their internment. Groups like the Japanese American Citizens League were key organizers of the movement. In 1980, Congress and President Carter approved the creation of the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. This commission investigated the causes and consequences of the mass internment. You know, organizing the community really was a very inspirational event. Uh, it was a time of healing. AJAs who were interned or evacuated came together and was able to share these stories. The commission's 1983 report acknowledged the injustice of the mass removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. It stated that these actions were carried out by the U.S. government without any acts of sabotage or espionage and were largely motivated by racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. A redress bill was introduced to Congress. It was named H.R. 442 in honor of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. The ultimate result of the redress movement was an acknowledgement by the United States government that the internment of Japanese Americans was unlawful. In 1988, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act. Former internees received a letter of apology from the president and $20,000 in compensation. However, in Hawaii, a large number of internees were first-generation immigrants. Many of them never received redress. About half of the internees uh, ultimately received redress because the other the remainder uh, had passed away. But I think for a lot of them, uh, for many, many years, they just had accepted it. And so the recognition of redress uh, really was an affirmation that they did nothing wrong. Through the redress process in Hawaii, new stories emerged. There was a small class of individuals that came up and said, well, am I eligible for redress? I was not interned, but I was displaced by the United States government. Uh, soldiers literally came in at gunpoint and said, you need to leave. There was approximately 2,000 Japanese Americans who were not interned, but who were evacuated. And this occurred all over the state. 
they lost uh, their homes, they could not go back. Uh, they lost places of businesses, and for all intents and purposes, they were deprived of their civil liberties. The Honolulu chapter of the JACL championed their cause. Through legal battles with the uh, Department of Justice, ultimately were able to get uh, redress for uh, this special class of citizens. Years passed, and the stories brought out by the redress movement began to fade into memory. How we got involved with the Honouli Uli internment camp was really kind of serendipitous. KHNL TV station, and they were going to air Schindler's List, so they wanted to know exactly where the Honouli Uli internment camp site was. And to our consternation, we, we couldn't find it. But more than that, we found people who said, I didn't know that Hawaii had internment camps. And so at that point, we realized that this was a very thinly documented period of Japanese history, and it was in great danger of being lost and forgotten. In 1998, the former site of the Honu'uli Uli internment camp was rediscovered by the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. The archeological element was another key thing that occurred in the last few years. It was really precipitated by uh, Jeff Burton uh, and Mary Farrell, who are archeologists, formerly with the National Park Service. Jeff and Mary have been doing archeology span of all the various sites, detention sites on the U.S. during World War II. And for them, the Hawaii sites were the last ones they hadn't really studied. And so I uh, applied for a grant to come out to Hawaii and look for all the internment sites. And working with the JCCH, we went to all the sites. The Sand Island internment camp is just about completely obliterated. But now it's like a big industrial park, and there's really nothing left. Today, the immigration station is used by the Department of Homeland Security. It's almost just like it was during World War II. On Kauai, there were four internment sites that we know of so far. The Lanai Jail, County Jail, and Courthouse are still intact. They still look like they did in World War II. On Maui, there were two sites that we know of, Haiku Camp and Wailuku Jail. Again, we don't have any maps or photographs of it, so we don't know exactly where it was, but we do have a couple oral histories that kind of describe it in relation to some of the features that are still there. The Kilauea military camp on the Big Island has buildings almost exactly the way they were during World War II. The buildings that were used to house the internees, to imprison the internees, are still present. Archaeology and research continues to be conducted primarily at Honu'uli'uli, Uli, the largest of the internment camps in Hawaii. So this could, this could be our place. This could be where the guard tower was, and you can see it's on a little bit of a slope. University of Hawaii West Oahu Field School became involved in 2010. Volunteers have also come out to assist with the archaeology. Some of them are descendants of the former internees. I'm going to ask Sarah to look at it because you have probably much better eyes than I do. A lot of times on the bottle, if it says Owens, can you see the oval? Can you tell what that is? They were an inspiration to our students because our students worked alongside them and asked, why are you here? And when they heard that their grandfather had been interned, it just made the whole experience more meaningful for them. In August in 2007, when we purchased the area from Campbell Estate, uh, we, we realized that this area was a very special place. We want this area to benefit all of the community. Partnerships between Monsanto, the landowner, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, the Honolulu chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, and UH West Oahu have led to several public pilgrimages to the site.
At that time, uh, there were just a handful of uh, internees who were still alive and only two, unfortunately, who were well enough to go to the site, along with many of the family members. I knew very little about my grandfather's internment. Um, it wasn't a subject that was brought up and it wasn't something that was talked about often. To think that my grandfather went through it and that he didn't talk about it, I find that that's just amazing that, you know, he could have gone through something, something like that and not ever complain about it. I find that remarkable. Um, I had talked to other people, friends, or, and I just mentioned that I'm going to go on the pilgrimage and people didn't even know that there was an intern camp in Hawaii. Honu'uli Uli Preservation is so important because of its educational value. It can be a living resource. To me, it just really brought history to life, and it's just a lot more than just reading it in the books, but to actually see it and feel it. And uh, the visit to the gulch was quite emotional. For me, it was somewhat enlightening. I had questions or feelings on three levels. First was Hanolui. I had never heard of it. He had never mentioned it to me, so I didn't know what it was. The second level was that, um, why my father? And then the third level was, um, it was nice to kind of have my father back. He hasn't been passed that long, but this was a way of uh, being with him again. It made me angry also that it could have happened but it was, it was very meaningful for me. Yeah. You know, we're looking at the 9-11 situation, and, and then again, we still do the same thing. We still discriminate. We, we still stereotype people. And, it, and it's easier for people in Hawaii to ignore this history, because it seems like this was such a small part of what happened during World War II. It's, it seems to me it's important to really take a look at what can happen in a society that when, when people are marginalized for whatever reason, are taken as the enemy or associated with the enemy, that we can be pretty cruel and, and treat entire groups of, of people as, as non-people. Having the sites available for people to really look at, think about, visit, provides a really concrete way in which people can say, okay, racial profiling, whether it's after 9-11 and it's Middle Eastern people or Sikhs or uh, people with turbans or whatever who we think might constitute an imminent danger to the United States and the use of torture and all of those kinds of things. It seems to me those are things that we need to really, really carefully think about. Well, I think that it's extremely important that we as Americans don't just celebrate all the things that make us great, but to also reflect upon the few times in American history when we've made mistakes, and to be open and honest about it. It was a time of war. For the United States, their intent was to protect their citizens. I think what they forgot was that these were their citizens. But I think people's experiences have to be talked about and delivered so that maybe we can minimize that discrimination. I, th I think it should be preserved so that people know that this kind of thing happened in, in the United States, in Hawaii. People don't know that there was a thing like Honolulu internment camp, but they're getting to know now, so we should preserve it. There are some who say, well, why, why talk about it? I think we should if only to remind ourselves that this can happen in our democracy if we're not vigilant, because it did. Efforts are ongoing to preserve the Honu'uli Uli internment camp and open it to the public as a historic site. A special resource study of the other 12 Hawaii confinement sites was recently announced. Many of the sites have faded into distant memory. Untold stories of the Hawaii internment experience and the people who lived through them continue to be discovered. <laughs>